coming up on International Trade Focus. We shall take a look at the export of palm oil from the perspective of actors within the oil palm sector. Industry players within the oil palm sector in Ghana say given the right resources and support from government, the sector can meet the local demand of oil palm and other derivatives. Currently, although Ghana exports oil palm and other derivatives, we still import. According to the Observatory of Economic Complexity, in 2019, Ghana exported $199 million worth of oil palm and other derivatives such as cooking oil. So with these impressive figures, on today's edition of International Trade Figures, we want to take a look at the export of palm oil from Ghana to destination countries. My name is Anna Spio and this is International Trade Figures. International Trade Figures is brought to you by Gold Good Energy, ADB, Truly, Agric and More, Public Elegance and Pediasi Valley Resorts. This episode promises to be informative. Stay tuned. Stay tuned for our focal point segment. Ghana produced an average of about 330 to 350,000 metric tons of crude palm oil annually. The annual demand is about 450,000 metric tons of palm oil and palm oil derivatives like vegetable cooking oil. This means that there's a shortfall in local supply that the country could produce. This shortfall is met by importation. Although the country needs a little over 150,000 metric tons to secure local demand, export figures show how Ghana spends more importing palm oil than it exports. According to the Observatory of Economic Complexity, OEC, Ghana exported about $199 million worth of palm oil and pure vegetable oil in 2019, of which palm oil makes up 50.6% of the total export, with other pure vegetable oils making up 42.1%. In terms of imports, the country imported about $295 million worth of palm oil products, with palm oil making up 74% of the total and 13.7% margarine. Other pure vegetable oils make up about 2.98% or $8.8 .8 million in imports. What is the untold story behind these figures? On today's focal point, we want to re-examine the palm oil industry once again. But this time, we want to look at the export of the product from the perspective of one of the actors in the oil palm sector. Oro Oil Ghana Limited. Most importantly, we would like to identify certain internal and external factors that put a strain on the palm oil sector in Ghana. The government of the day puts a strong emphasis on the oil palm industry. Ministry of Trade and Industry has identified the oil palm industry as a strategic anchor industry and is pursuing plans to redevelop palm oil because of the multifunctional nature of the crop. A similar initiative was undertaken from 2001 to 2008 with the President's Special Initiative on PSI Palm Oil, which sought to develop a strong oil palm industry. The difference this time is that the government is trying to revamp old industries and the government's One District, One Factory initiative. Minister of Trade and Industry Honorable Alan Chemating underscored the importance of the industry when he toured some factories under the One District One Factory in 2020. The oil palm industry is a, a major uh, foreign exchange and in Malaysia, for example, uh, they earn over $25 billion per annum from oil palm and its uh, product derivatives. And uh, we believe that uh, Ghana can replicate what Malaysia has been able to do. And uh, we've identified the oil palm industry as one of the new strategic anchor industries to diversify the economy away from gold. So uh, the children of uh, La Pia America has taken up the challenge and they've applied uh, for support under 1D1F. And because it falls within the category of companies, industries, sectors that we are promoting under the 1D1F, uh, 
uh, we will do whatever we can to support them. Uh, we are helping them to raise additional financing, to bring in uh, some new equipment, also to uh, bring in uh, some specialized raw materials uh, for, for their production process. All that they will be importing uh, will come in duty free because one of the incentives under the one um, the financing from the local banks will also uh, come at a subsidized interest rate and then they also enjoy a tax holiday for five years. But we are keen in supporting companies like this because that's what the president has been preaching about, adding value to our local natural resources. Also being able to produce to replace uh, imports for goods that we can easily produce. But it goes beyond that. Also being able to uh, produce what we can export uh, to earn foreign exchange. And you know that the continental food chain area will start trading uh, 1st of January. And I'm very confident that with the reputation of uh, this company and the quality of their product, that once we are able to help them on the one demand to come back uh, into full operation, that will become one of the leading companies that will be exported under the FCFT. Thank you. Incidentally, some local oil palm factories are producing significant volumes and others are expanding their capacities. For instance, Brim Oil Mills, which started under the PSI, has announced its intention to start a nucleus farm and add more outgrowers to its outgrower scheme with support from the One District One Factory Secretariat. Here is the managing director of Brim Oil Mills last year. 30 ton per hour mill. So what it means is that it is capable of processing about 560 tons of FFB fresh fruit bunch per day, 500 and of palm oil, yeah, a day. And then after that, we extract what we call um, palm kernel oil, uh, which is almost about 10 percent of that 560 tons per day. So that means almost about 56 tons of oil can be extracted, uh, PKO, palm kernel oil, can be extracted. We have our own turbine, turbine that can generate electricity uh, for the company. For all the processes that we're doing, we depend on the turbine. We have uh, what we call boiler, and that boiler is supposed to uh, generate steam to sterilize our fruits and also to propel the turbine uh, so that the turbine can generate electricity for the for the for the fa factory. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> there is also market for the products. And um, if you look around, you can see that. Uh, we can, if we get to the maximum capacity, we can employ a lot of people. As at now, we have almost about 120 uh, uh, workers. Um, so we are trying to even do better than, than so that. What is your maximum capacity? Yes, our maximum capacity is supposed to be about 560 tons per day. Uh, of, fresh fruit bunch or the fresh fruit bunch or if you like you can call it of palm oil or palm, uh, palm fruits there were a lot of sensitization program that went around so uh, farmers uh, started bringing out some fruits and so we have been very very active very very active uh, from uh, 2019 2020 if you look at our operations, uh, basically we is financing. As I said, we have a capacity of about 30 ton per day, per hour, and this demand a bigger plantation that will feed this mill. 
All the mills that we have in the country, that government built those mills, are supported by what we call the nucleus uh, farms. Uh, we are here to get our nucleus farm. We depend on the PSI. Uh, and so we need almost about uh, a minimum of about 4,000 hectares of oil palm plantation uh, to take care of this uh, mill. Bonso Oil Palm Plantation is performing significantly well, posting strong dividends on the stock market, even in the face of several challenges, which we will later discuss. However, some internal and external factors have bedeviled the sector. For this piece, we were limited to exports. Despite the best intention towards the oil palm sector, government policy seems to be working in contrast to its intentions. This, to some extent, is evident in the import-export figure and disparities between oil palm and vegetable oils. The main culprit of this impact, according to industry players, is the blanket benchmark policy reduction without consideration to some key industries. In 2017, the Vice President, Dr. Mahamud Balmia, announced a 50% reduction in benchmark values at the port. The situation soon made imported vegetable oil cheaper than the locally produced ones, since the production cost of a barrel of oil locally was more expensive than imported oil. As a result, it was cheaper to import crude palm oil to refine by local refineries. To avoid making losses, local producers preferred to export crude palm oil, for instance, considering the top three export destinations for Ghana's crude palm oil. The Trend Economy website reports that the country in 2017 exported about $60 million worth of palm oil and its factions. To Senegal, $17.7 million to Benin and $8.7 million worth of palm oil and its derivatives to Burkina Faso. On the contrary, the country still imported over $81 million worth of palm oil and its factions, chiefly from Malaysia, $22 million from Indonesia and $8.2 million from Côte d'Ivoire. Though other factors determine the performance of the trade of crude palm oil, these figures are revealing. Import and export figures of pure vegetable oils presented in the OEC's profile of Ghana shows that in 2019, the country, although it exported $83 million worth of pure vegetable oil, only imported $8.8 million worth of the same product in the same year. Other factors include poor technology used by artisan millers and processes in extracting palm oil from palm fruit. In the process, they lose most of their expected oil extraction rate. These are but a few of the challenges plaguing the sector. For us to reduce the importation of crude palm oil into, into the country, that means uh, we have to increase our production line. And uh, to increase our production line, that means we should get the best technologies or we should get the appropriate technology for this artisanal millers to be able to produce the quality of crude palm oil that is needed by these uh, industries you understand and uh, for us to do that products for us to in bring on the appropriate technology that has to do with investment when it comes to external factors, the challenges that existed in trading within ECOWAS sub-region are a prominent feature. Some industry players say they have identified Nigeria as a prominent emerging market for palm oil due to their thriving industries. Doing business in Nigeria is far more challenging. Managing Director of Oro Oil Ghana Limited, Mr. Maxwell Nikome, lamented about the challenges they had to face trying to export to the Nigerian market. He explained that his shipments destined to the Nigerian markets always suffers delays at the various entry borders along the way, with some countries charging unauthorized fees to allow the goods passage. One of his challenges 
is countries taking unilateral decisions outside the ECOWAS treaty to charge imports levies and tolls on the movement of goods. The government had always identified the industry as relevant to its development agenda. Recently, government unveiled the Tree Crop Development Authority to develop seven tree crops, including oil palm. It is therefore incumbent on the private sector, government agencies and stakeholders to make the industry succeed. If not for anything, oil palm is a basic raw material for several other industrial products, food and cosmetic goods for domestic use. Maxwell Kome, the general manager of Oro Ghana Oil Limited, joins us on our in depth segment today as we take a look at the export of palm oil from Ghana to its destination countries. Our in depth segment comes up next. Stay tuned. Tell us about Oro Oil Ghana Limited. Oro Oil Ghana Limited is a limited liability company registered under the laws of this country. Um, it was established somewhere in 2010. We are into uh, cultivation of oil palm plantation, processing of palm oil, exporting of palm oil. So it's, 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 it's a whole value chain industry by its own. So we, 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 we have a plantation, we have a processing mill, and then we have an export uh, sector. So when we produce our raw uh, our CPO, we export them to Nigeria and then to other parts of Europe. So that is basically what, what we do. Our plantation is in Begro in the eastern region. And then the mill, that is a processing plant, is in Kede. It's also in the eastern region but at least put them together as one business entity. And then we also have the export aspect. And that is where you are now. Uh, it's also another setup which is in charge of our export. So putting all these three sectors together is what we call Oro Oil. What is the potential of the oil palm sector? Oil palm should be, should be the major export commodity for Ghana. Uh, a lot of governments, as I said earlier, have tried in so many ways to impact the industry. But what is lacking is the political will to make the change and then the policy interventions to protect the industry. You know, when we talk about the oil palm industry, it's a long value chain. You start from the plantation. That is from the soil to the home. You get the plantation the mills, the refiners, the manufacturers, the distributors, and then the final consumer. And if you look at this value chain, it cut across everybody, transporters, the millers. In fact, in Ghana here, if you have one, acre, one hectare plantation, that is one hectare, you employ not less than six people or seven. So if you have 1,000 hectares, you, you can imagine the number of workers you employ. If you go to the refineries and the processes, the workforce is very big. Now, apart from the fact that this uh, workforce, that is the labor, the labor aspect of all this value chain is huge, the economic aspect, oil palm is the only tree crop that has two finished products. We have palm kernel oil, and then we have crude palm oil. And these two products are most expensive and less expensive in one way. When you compare them to any other oil, palm oil is the most demanded one because somewhere along the line, it will be very cheaper for everybody to I mean, acquire. The demand for it is the biggest among all the oils. So, if you take Ghana for instance, the money we use to import the excess oil alone, that is the 150 to 200,000 metric tons annually, is over 250 to 300 million dollars as we speak today. 
if all these monies were to be kept back home because we are able to produce sufficient, then trust me, it's, it's, it's a good news for the country. Here, it is, here is the case, whatever we even produce locally is not enough. So we have to export, import all these SS. Even though we also export, but what we export is, 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 is of a tiny, I mean, uh, number. It's not significant in terms of the volume we need as a country. There is no single uh, home in this country that doesn't use palm oil in any single day. You may not be aware that you are using palm oil, but trust me, it is palm oil you use. Be it soap, be it milo, be it chocolate, be it whatever you can mention. I mean, there is no single home in this country that would wake up in the morning till the evening without consuming palm oil in any form. So the demand is, is, is such that it is very big on a daily basis. The unfortunate thing is that when we talk about palm oil, it appears to me that people think it is just the red oil when you go to the market and then you see, and that is what we refer to palm oil. That is the raw material. What we see in the market as red is the raw material, the crude palm oil. This crude palm oil goes through a process, refinery process, and then they will refine it into two or three parts. One is called PFAD, one is called crude olein, uh, crude olein another one is stearine, and then we have the final product, that is the stearine. And all these products are used in various areas for manufacturing processes. So some of them are being used for margarine, the stearine, uh, the stearine. Some of them are being used for soups, the PFAD. Some of them are being used for chocolates. I mean, every aspect of our daily life, we use palm oil. What volume of palm oil do you export? Oro oil export close to 1,500 to 2,000 met metric tons on a monthly basis. And uh, almost all these products end up in Nigeria because the consumption in Nigeria is, is unprecedented. So the demand is always available. We've done this for the past 10 years. And uh, trust me, uh, if you have additional 500,000 metric tons as oro, we can still export it because the demand is, is, is always available. What impact will the Tree Crop Development Authority have on the oil palm sector? I, I am one of the board members of the Tree Crop Development Authority, yes. And uh, it's a good intention, trust me. You see, uh, when a certain government comes with an idea, such as establishing tree crop development authority to oversee the affairs of this, you know, uh, industries. It means that there is the political, you know, ambition, will to make sure that these industries are moving forward to do more. But then it's not just about the establishing, establishment of the, the, the board. It's about the working the, 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 the political will to push it. Our board was set up somewhere last year, September. We are still yet to have our office to be equipped in Kumasi. We are yet to get financing even to, 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 to pay some of you know, the employee staffs. So it's not just about establishing it. It's about making sure the thing works. This three crop development authority should be one of the best agenda of this government to make sure that these six three crops, oil, palm, cashew, uh, mango, coffee, and rubber, and, and, and the other one, in the next eight years or 10 years, should be able to you know, export and bring in at least $24 billion. But trust me, it's not just about talking. It's about working. Oil, palm, as we speak today, we need 
not less than 100,000 hectares of land planted before we become self-sufficient and even be able to export some of our assets. But trust me, this is a big investment to establish 1,000 acre of oil palm plantation, you need not less than $2 million. So if the, if, the, if the government just say, let's establish this without financial support, without the, the, the financial institutions, the banking sector being orientated to understand that, look, this is what we are doing. We want you on board. Come on board. Specific political interventions, allocation of specific loans, to these six tree crops, to cushion them, to be able to function well. It's just a talk, trust me. Because no financial institution would want to finance an industry whereby it would take five years before it will start yielding. Unless the political will, the government, takes a special interest to assign certain grants through the banks to be able to issue to these industries, so that when this industry starts to produce, we can export and pay these banks to the banks. But if all these things are not done, it is just like you set up the board just to be a board by name. If you just tuned in, you're watching International Trade Figures, and this is our ended segment. We're taking a look at the export of palm oil from Ghana to destination countries, some challenges that industry players face, and pragmatic solutions that we can find to these challenges. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. A warm welcome back. You're watching International Trade Figures. This is our in-depth segment. Maxo Kome is the General Manager, Oro Oil Ghana Limited. We're taking a look at the export of palm oil to destination countries. What is the state of the oil palm industry in Ghana currently? You know, in Ghana, private sector uh, has always got a lot of challenges, uh, be it policy intervention, uh, financing, uh, land acquisition. So these are the three major issues that as Oro Oil we have gone through and uh, acquiring land in Ghana has always been a big challenge, trust me. Um, we would have wished we, we, we expand our plantation, but uh, to get a portion of land that is with all the litigation free, it's, it's, it's having, I mean, white hand uh, arrangement has always been a, a challenge. You start from one point and then we get to a point and then people will pop out demanding ownership and a whole lot of things. So it, it's limiting our plantation sizes. Um, from there, I mean, the, the milling aspect, uh, it, it's a bit challenging because uh, you also need uh, policy intervention and then financing to to be able to produce as much as possible to export. Uh, when you talk about the export aspect, that one is, is, is a bit more tedious because uh, we have two markets as Oro. We have market in, in, in Europe and then we have market in ECOWAS. The Europe one looks a bit more easier, but the market is not big. But when you look at the uh, ECOWAS one, it's very big as market, but very challenging to, 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 to pursue. We do a lot of export to Nigeria. I mean, 90% of what we produce goes to Nigeria. We don't only export our own products, but we also buy from other millers because uh, our market strength in Nigeria is very big. Now, let me give you a scenario. Uh, Nigeria as a country um, has a demand or a consumption capacity of about 2 million tons of oil. That is uh, red palm oil, vegetable oil, and all other uh, oils. Put together, the demand in Nigeria is around 2 million tons. But currently, what they produce is between 900,000 to 1.1 million. So they have a deficit of about 1 million tons of oil annually. 
And so it's a big market for the ECOWAS to exploit. Uh, in ECOWAS, Ghana is the third largest producer of palm oil. Ivory Coast is first. Nigeria is second. Ghana is third. But in terms of the demand, Nigeria is the highest uh, consumer. So if you look at Ghana and Nigeria, Ghana could have taken the biggest opportunity to expand our plantations. And then we have a very conducive arrangement with Nigeria so that if Ghana is producing in excess of what we uh, consume, then we can export the rest to Nigeria. Here is the case. The consumption capacity in Ghana is between 350 to 400,000 metric tons annually. What we produce locally is around 250,000 tons. So in this case, we also have a deficit of about 150 to 200,000 metric tons. And all these uh, you know, deficits are being imported from Malaysia and Indonesia. So you could see that if Ghana will set a priority on oil palm, then we're going to be the second Malaysia because the demand is already there. We don't have to produce crude palm oil and search for buyers elsewhere. We have our neighbors who are you know, ready, available to buy it for you. But the biggest challenge we have as a country is the political will. Do you see any opportunities in the African continental free trade area, AFCFTA, for the oil palm sector? We are in a ECOWAS of 15 countries, 15 countries. And trust me, I have worked within this ECOWAS in terms of my export for the past 10 years. Nothing works. Nothing works within the ECOWAS. I keep on asking myself, how would it be possible that a countries like the 15 ECOWAS nations come on board to establish ECOWAS without setting up binding laws? then the whole agreement is Libra. That if I want this, I will just notify the ECOA that this is what I want, and then I should be allowed to do it. Not in a single year, with my experience in 10 years, that I have done export in Nigeria, to Nigeria, without either Benin blocking their border, or Nigeria blocking their border, or Togo blocking their border. As I speak to you today, Benin have blocked their border, demanding for all exports going through Nigeria to pay duty even though they are on transit. Within 15 ECOWAS countries, there is always arbitrations and conflicts of whatever it is. Then the purpose of this ECOWAS is for economic purpose so that we can work within ourselves, make our economies bigger. Yet, if you want to export to Nigeria, you get to Benin, Benin will not even inform you before. You get there, they say pay duty. You get to Nigeria, Nigeria say we we'll we'll close our border. When you get to Benin, you are asked to pay a toll gate of 32,000 sefa, which is close to 450 Ghana cities. When you get to Ghana, you are asked to pay four Ghana cities. So what is happening in Benin, what is happening in Ghana? We are all in the same ECOWAS. There is the need for certain things to be strengthened very well before. They could have even divided it into four. ECOWAS is one. Another regime, another, I mean, Africa countries group them into four. Let them tie themselves very well. Become very solid in whatever economic activities they do. Before you join all these four people together, all four, I mean, uh, entities together to make them one economic uh, 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 Africa, uh, uh, how do you call it? But you can't just wake up and say, we want to put the whole 52 countries in Africa together and let them work in economic aspect so that when you are going through this place, you don't pay duty when you are going here or what, I mean, even when ECOWAS is not working. Trust me, it is very difficult. And one thing that makes me I mean, see it as a very difficult thing is that 
the whole thing we are discussing gets to do with currency. Euro became very strong because they were having uh, uh, one currency in Europe. As we speak, I was so worried when I heard that the heads of states, when they met here, the echo was supposed to be, you know, in place in 2021, right? So it tells you that even before the COVID last year, the echo was supposed to be in place in 2021. When the heads of state met, they said because of the COVID and inconveniences, they are pushing it to 2027. 2020, uh, so, it tells you that the whole system is not ready. Because something that was supposed to be ready in a year, if for a reason of a COVID, you were not able to establish it. It's supposed to be the following year. Because you were already ready, prepared to establish it. But something came in that prevented you to what, establish it. So it shouldn't take you to another six years or seven years. So it tells you that, I mean, the heads of states, one way or the other. So I will encourage the youth to go back into our Greek. I will also discourage our aged, especially people going on pension, to always say that when they go on pension, that is the time they, they start agriculture. It is not good. Agriculture is not meant for the old people or the pensioners. Agriculture is meant for people who are youth with new energy, with new technology, with new scientific ideas. So when I hear people saying that as soon as I go on pension at the age of 60, I'm going back to my village to start farming, it, it's discouraging the youth. So please, I encourage the Ghanaian youth, the best way to become a CEO is to go to your farm, start your own establishment, do something, be it aquaculture, be it animal farm, be it uh, cultivation of uh, crops. Once you start that, you can boast of your own self being a CEO of your own industry. Then from there, you can start exporting. The government has put up a lot of flashy prog programs like planting for food and uh, planting for export and other things. Nobody will come and sit down with you as an individual to convince you too much to go into it. But it is you as an individual to decide on what you want to do for your living. And that does it for our in-depth segment. There's news and events after this break. Don't go away. And it's a wrap for today's edition of International Trade Figures. Join us same time next week for some more on international trade-related activities here in Ghana and beyond. International Trade Figures is brought to you by Gold Good Energy, ADB, Truly Agricant, More Public Elegance, and Pediasi Valley Resort. My name is Anastio. Bye-bye. Join us same time next week. Mm -hmm.